Welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner covering. Uh, I was going to. I was going to say covering Sergey Ling's basic mathematics, but that was a long time ago. This is Daniel V. Schoeder's An Introduction to Thermal Physics, and this is section 1.7, which is rates of processes, where he discusses how long these thermodynamic interactions actually take. And really, this section is more about explaining why thermodynamics is not enough, why you need to consider the kinetic theory as well. So in this subsection, we talk about viscosity. You might already know what viscosity is. You might have, at least if you have anything to do with you know, engine oil, or stuff like that, you probably have some notion of what viscosity is and why it's important. The viscosity concept comes from a question about what happens if we are not just spreading energy through a fluid, and a fluid can be a liquid or a gas, so we're spreading energy through a fluid, and we've talked about in the last subsection of how that energy has to travel through the molecules themselves. So the particles themselves carry the energy from one part of the fluid to the other part. And so we have to consider how fast these particles are traveling, how many collisions they make in a unit of time, things like that. So what happens when we transfer momentum? I always like watching young physics students when they first learn about collisions and they think that energy is like, energy is this fantastic concept that gives you all kinds of insight into how things behave and you can do all kinds of stuff with energy. But Really, there's two factors that you have to think about when you're considering collisions. One is the energy and one is the momentum. And typically, if you look at things from the momentum perspective, you can more quickly derive correct answers about the behavior of the collision. So what happens if we're thinking about momentum transfer? So in this example, what he has is he has two solid plates. And in between these two solid plates, he has some sort of fluid. And there's a UN fluid. And one of these plates is traveling at a velocity. All right. And there's some velocity that this plate is traveling at. Not to be confused with the velocity of the particles in the fluid or the velocity of the fluid as a whole as it moves. And the other one is stationary. It has no velocity. And in between we have a fluid, a liquid or a gas. And we're going to keep the delta Z between the top and the bottom. We're going to keep that small enough that we don't have to worry about eddy currents and circular things that might happen with larger flows, uh, we're going to say that the flow is itself laminar. If you're a fan of Smarter Every Day, you'll know that he is obsessed with laminar flow. You can watch, like, I think he has like 20 videos that he talks about laminar flow. Anyway, so we're going to consider uh, laminar flow. And laminar flow occurs when the fluid is slow enough. When it's not moving too quickly, we, do, we don't get uh, disturbances and and vortices and stuff like that, okay? Now the fluid itself is sticky, right? And I guess the reason why it's sticky and why you should consider it sticky is because these particles are actually colliding with those plates. And when they collide with those plates, there's a difference in velocity. And so the particles near the surface of this plate are gonna have an average velocity of the top plate. And the particles near the surface of this plate are gonna have an average velocity uh, of zero right? Because of the collisions that are going to happen there. All right. And by average velocity, I'm not saying, you know, what is like, take all the, the velocity magnitudes and look at each particle. I'm saying like, if you add up all the vectors of velocity, then in the horizontal direction, these particles aren't moving left or right. Okay. You, but you can find particles that are moving left and particles that are moving right. All right. There is an important exception that occurs at very low T. So at very low temperature, uh, the particles may begin to behave in a very special way where they don't resist the motion. There's no force that you need to apply to the top plate to keep it moving. We see the same thing happen with uh, superconductors at low temperatures. When the fluid resists the motion of the top plate, when you have to apply some kind of force to the top plate to keep it moving, then we say that there is viscosity in the fluid itself. What's happening is your force here is being transferred to this fluid and it's being transferred to this bottom plate, right? So if there was like a frictionless surface below this bottom plate and you pushed on the top plate, then the two plates would move together. But in this case, we're fixing the bottom plate and we're pushing on the top plate. And so the, the fluid itself is pushing back against you through Newton's third law. Things that have high viscosity resist more. Okay, this is something like corn syrup. If you've ever tried to get corn syrup out of a bottle, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, things that have low viscosity resist less. 
This is things like water and air. Okay, they're very slippery. It takes a tiny force to move the top plate, whereas with corn syrup, you can push really hard and it's only gonna move so fast. As we did talking about how the temperature gradient occurs in the material, we're going to say that the force that you apply in the x direction is gonna be proportional to a number of things. First, if the plates are bigger, then that means you're gonna need more force. So we're gonna, we're gonna suppose that it's proportional to the area of the plates. The next thing we're gonna imagine is that it's also, we're gonna call the velocity of the fluid ux, right? And so it's the velocity in the x direction of the areas of fluid, right? We're also gonna say the force is proportional to the difference in the speeds of the, the particles, the, not the particles, the speeds of the fluid. So we say ux at the top minus ux at the bottom. We're also going to think that the thicker the gap, the less force is required. So we're going to have it inversely proportional to how close the plates are to each other. Another way to write this is you say the force in the x direction divided by the area of the plates is proportional to the difference in that velocity of the fluid over the separation between the plates. And so we can write a function, or we can write a formula, where we say the magnitude of the force in the x direction divided by the area is equal to this Greek letter that looks like an N, it's called eta, and then it's du in the x direction by dz. All right, and this eta is called the coefficient of viscosity. The coefficient of viscosity. If we do a little bit of dimension analysis, we will see that the force is in units of newtons, area is meters squared, the velocity is in meters per second, and this is units of meters, and so what unit does eta have to take on? So eta will have units of newtons over meters squared per second, okay? Now, newtons per meter squared, that's just a pascal. So this is pascals per second. Now, pascal is generally associated with pressure. However, in this case, this is not pressure. This is not force applied against an area. This is for force applied across an area. So we call this the shear stress. This is the shear stress. That's the newtons per meter squared unit, okay? Some typical viscosities that you might see is water has an eta of 0 0.0018 pascals per second at zero degrees Celsius, but that lowers significantly to 0 0.00028 pascals per second at boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. Motor oil uh, if it's SAE10, so oil, has an eta of 0 0.25 pascals per second. Air has 19 micropascals per second. Problem 166 is where you'll try to derive the formula calculating the viscosity of an ideal gas. You, if you do this correctly, you should note that the viscosity, surprisingly, of an ideal gas does not depend on the pressure. However, it does increase with T. That means the more temperature in the air, the more like uh, corn syrup the air behaves and the less like water. This is very surprising behavior but it is similar to how we calculated for the case of T, the thermal conductivity of air. It does not depend on P, but it does increase with the square root of T. The reason why we had this result was that even though the amount of energy carried from one part of the gas to another is proportional to the density of particles. 
because the length of the mean free path also depends on the inverse density of the particles, then the pressure doesn't matter at all. You can increase the density of the particles and it won't change the thermal conductivity. You'll find the same thing happens when you calculate eta for an ideal gas. Calculating that it increases with T, you'll note for a liquid, eta decreases with T increasing, right? So as you lower the temperature of a liquid, it becomes more viscous, and as you raise it, it becomes less viscous. So it's like the opposite of the ideal gas. His explanation here is that the mean free path inside of a liquid doesn't depend on temperature and pressure. There's another factor, however, that does come into play, okay? When the temperature is low, the molecules stick to each other more. They have more time being stuck to each other and less time moving from one position to another. And so at the very lowest temperature, the viscosity becomes almost infinite because the, the particles themselves are basically locked into each other. He makes a note here in the final sentence. He said, solids can flow like fluids. So a solid you can think of is as a liquid where everything's just frozen in place. They're no longer moving around. But if you go over geological timescales and consider things like quantum mechanics, you can have particles that should be locked together eventually slipping past each other and moving like a fluid. And indeed, you can see that with even like thin sheets of stone, you can see it bend and move and stuff like that. So anyway, this is a strange section because the problem that you're assigned is to come up with the formula to show how ideal gases behave in terms of viscosity with temperature and pressure and stuff like that. Uh, last section, the next session is diffusion, and then we'll be on chapter two, the second law. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know if you have any questions. Take care and bye-bye.